What's up, you two? Say hello. Welcome to Making It in Asheville. This is our second podcast episode that we are releasing here on this channel. Uh, we are hoping to get better and better at this as we go along. But in the meantime, we're super excited to have you here. Yes. And thank you for joining us. This episode is one of Sarah's absolute favorite. We were talking about it. Don't tell anyone. Yeah, we don't want to not to say anything about the other episodes. <laughs> this one's just very special. There's a lot of really thoughtfulness uh, from Garnet Fisher, who is the artist that we interview. Um, this episode on YouTube will be a static frame after our intro to the intro, but we just wanted to say hello to you, offer you that you subscribe and comment. Tell us about yourself. We will make this YouTube channel better over time, but thank you for being here now. So let's get into the episode. High five. Cool. See you soon. <laughs> You're such a geek. <laughs> Something my mom would say is that she lives simply so that others may simply live. I've always really liked that. So that by changing my definition of what is enough, hopefully that means that I'm freeing up some resource for someone else to have it. Or even what we were saying of by me working this job and making money, um, to try to gain something from the value I give other people, if I can then turn around and give that to someone who doesn't have as much, then we all can uplift each other in that way. Welcome to Making It in Asheville, a podcast where you get to hear the stories behind some of your favorite artists and businesses in town. In each episode, we interview a local entrepreneur or creative that is making it in Asheville and work to uncover actionable insights from each conversation. And we're your host. I'm Tony, and that was Sarah. We are a husband and wife team that moved to Asheville with no clear plan of what would happen next. So we set out to answer one question. How does one make it in Asheville? And that's when we decided to start a podcast. We would interview local makers and share valuable lessons from each episode. And the rest, as they say, is history. This episode is powered by our marketing agency, Making It Creative. We help passionate business owners develop meaningful marketing messages and storytelling to grow their business. Visit makingitcreative.com to learn more. And in this episode, we sit down with Garnet Fisher, one of our absolute favorite artists here in Asheville. You might have seen her work if you've ever popped into Old North on Lexington Ave in downtown Asheville. Yeah, she, she paints these sort of minimalist abstract prints. Um, they use very few strokes with black ink. It's, it's a lot like I guess, a Zen style, which I don't know if that's how she would characterize her artwork, but um, for us, it, it's very memorable in that way. Um, so in this episode, we sit down with Garnet and we learn about how she started painting, why she started painting, and how she's gone about developing her own style. And Garnet, who goes by Nettie, um, is super thoughtful and intentional and you can see that certainly in her work but also in her responses and the conversation we had was incredibly meaningful one of the highlights that stands out for me was the idea of working from a place that is enough and how powerful it can be if you're able to access that feeling of enough while you know just living but certainly while trying to create yeah, Nettie seems really sort of tuned in to this other aspect of life, right? Like it's it's not just about making art and making money from her art, um, but rather for her, it's, it's really having a stable um, job so that she is able to practice her art in a way that is fulfilling for her. Um, so I think this one resonates a lot, can resonate a lot with Maybe, you know, if you're an artist here in town and you're trying to figure out a way to make it, uh, we think this is a great episode full of valuable lessons. And one of our favorite parts about Nettie is how she actually creates all of this art while working a part-time job as a designer for a marketing company. 
And in her own words, she had a little apprehension about being on a podcast called Making It in Asheville when she doesn't identify as a full-time artist and creator. Um, And for that very reason, we knew that we needed to have her on the show because the act of, I think, supporting your passion with something that is stable and reliable is the essence of what we're trying to uncover here and making it in Asheville. And so this is a story that we are very excited to share. And that's just a part of the story. Yeah. And and the last thing that I'll add of something that stood out for me from this episode was that Nettie is an Asheville native. Um, she's grown up here. She's she's left here. She's lived, lived in other places. Um, but she moved back here because she found that this place was just so beautiful and that she was so in touch with nature here. And a, a big part of the reason why she's staying here is because she wants to see the impact that she can have on the community um, and not just, you know, leave it behind because it's becoming overrun with tourists or more people are moving here, um, but, but rather, you know, see a change and, and see a change for the better. So without further ado, let's just uh, hop into this episode with Garnet Fisher, a.k.a. Nettie, uh, episode 38. Please enjoy. Cool. And so maybe we'll just do the uh, very simple but um, very important who are you and where are we right now? Sure. Um, I am Garnet Fisher. Um, where are we right now? We are in my house, in my dining room um, in West Asheville. And it is great to be here. Thank you for having us. This is uh, the home studio, mm-hmm. air quotes, and which we would love to see the studio. Maybe, Absolutely. Maybe we should... Can we maybe we'll just pause? Yeah, and then just so that we can say that we've seen the studio. It's literally just 10 feet imagine from it's here. just here. not too much. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> cool. So yeah. uh, you hang right there, li- listener. It, you won't notice that we leave the room and check it out and then come back, uh, but we will. Cool. I, I would love to actually see yeah. your space. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's just right back here. There's this guy that does. Uh, he just has like bad art, five dollars, and sits on the street with a sign. Yeah. And when I first started, I was doing, um, I was posting things under the handle "weird bad art machine." <laughs> I, was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to, you know, just whatever, make yeah. whatever, post it. Who cares? So I was like, bad art. I love bad art. So we sit down. He's like, would you guys mind if I draw you nude? And before I could say anything, Ian's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> So we were like, okay, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> this is new. <laughs> yep. And that, that's what came out of it. It's actually not that bad of art either. Oh, I didn't. There's a there's a nude you and Ian somewhere in the space? There's a drawing of us on the fridge. Oh, fun. Yeah, it's really. <laughs> nude bad art. Bad mm-hmm. art machine. I, I would like, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. That's a savvy. I uh, feel like, a, I don't know. There's. There are so many ways to get started in art. My gut says, I don't have, clearly, I'm speaking outside of my depth, but there's some parallel to starting a podcast. Mm. My, my, my gut says that if you can uh, gamify publishing or producing or finishing, saying it's done, yeah. and somehow showing it, that's, that's a good muscle to work on, as important perhaps as the skill itself. Definitely, yeah. Mm. Sharing it with people. You have to get it out in the world. And if you, you know, and if you take some of the stress out by calling it bad art, mm-hmm. it, doesn't, it sounds actually really smart. It sounds like a really <laughs> smart thing to do. Yeah, it, it was definitely a good way to get started. Just to, you know, yeah, take the stress out of it, take the pressure off. Didn't even have my name associated with it. It's actually sort of how the all caps thing came about. All caps thing. Yeah, where it was just like the profile for the account was hello i am weird bad art machine here is art for you or something you know it was just dumb and silly and really easy to have fun with it so it ga- it gained this sort of robotic voice mm-hmm. of who knows who's the person behind this and i don't have to be me when i'm posting it i yeah. can post whatever so 
that part stuck um, even when I carried it over. At some point, I was just like, I don't want to maintain two Instagram accounts. Mm. So I started posting to to my core account, but um, maintained some of that voice. How fun. Actually. So is, is I, I didn't actually notice this. Is your, your bios in all caps? Is that what you mean by the all caps? No, uh, my bio is not actually, but all of the titles of the paintings are all caps. There you go. Mm. And they're usually two words. There's a little bit of like wordplay that I try to have fun with of things that just are fun to say. Um, there's definitely an intuitive sense to the way that I create the paintings and name them, where I try to let them tell me what they're about. Um, so just like a word that pops into my head and pairing it with something that sort of creates a concept but doesn't have to. Um, yeah, but they're always all caps, two words, usually kind of short words. I uh, like that one we were just looking at was false forest. And the other one actually doesn't have a name yet. Hmm. Yeah, well, let's, uh, recently. let's maybe, let's all name it. I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> imposing uh, I got a, I got a couple two word, short word, mean something means nothing ideas. Uh-huh. <laughs> sort of sorry. Hmm. To go with the alliteration. Sort of sorry. Yeah. Sort of. I like that. Sort of sorry. Mm-hmm. It's, I'm not really sorry. <laughs> sort of sorry. Mm-hmm. You, you hit me with the alliteration of false forest and I couldn't not. That is definitely, that is something that's fun to say. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's part of it. Whether it's alliterative or words that just sound like they should go together. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of what some of the other ones would be. Hmm. hmm. Reverse reflection. Alliteration. One, also alliteration. Oh, no, I'm blanking. I'm thinking we need a (laughs) 26-piece show of alliterations in every letter. Yeah. Always awesome. I don't know. Fuck. (laughs) Alliteration art. Alliteration art. Alliterative Mm. art. That's so interesting. (laughs) And does the, the, you said the words come second. So it's like the art... Mm -hmm comes out and then you the name shows up it's not like i would say all right i'm cactus go no definitely not um some of the pieces that are more landscapes definitely have a reference um flat laurel is flat laurel creek um but they're based on my memory of that place i rarely will go actually sit or look at a photograph and try to represent exactly what that looks like. It's more just like I've somewhere I've been um, several times that you have this impression of the way that the trees sweep over the river or the way this one big rock kind of looms on the side. And I'll try to capture that. But most of the abstract pieces have more to do with trying to process an emotion or um, capture a feeling and sometimes I don't really know what that feeling is until later and that sometimes comes out in naming it Um, like reverse reflection for a while I was doing a series of pieces where a circle a small circle would represent a person and there was usually two people And then lines around them or boxes would represent certain ways that they might be letting other people in, not letting other people in, um, communicating or projecting or just different kind of complex interactions between people. And the naming is sort of capturing that essence of that interaction. Mm -hmm. These people in this particular example, are they people that you know close and you're very close to, or are they tend to be people you've just had one-off encounters with, or perhaps it's both? It could be both. It's usually a little more uh, removed from a specific encounter, um, but it could be something just about like, isn't it interesting that humans do this? Mm-hmm. Isn't it interesting that humans will let 
a complete stranger in, but then hide who they really are from people they're actually really close to. Mm. Um, yeah, or some of them are just expressions of what joy feels like, what it feels like to walk through the water at the beach to feel the waves kind of move past you. Like, what, what is that sense of calm? Um, one of the ones that we were just looking at, too, was an expression of feeling very frazzled and trying to let a sense of calm wash over me, almost in the way of a prayer or a mantra. Um, and usually, yeah, usually in the moment I paint that as a reflection of the emotion. There's no logical putting words around it even feels really clunky mm -hmm. and awkward. Um, usually it's looking back at it later that I can say like, okay, that's, that's what that feeling was. That's the context of that, at least roughly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. What about the... I don't know, we're going really deep into the art and we can back up and talk about the story in a little bit, but <laughs> okay. um, I'm wondering what are the reactions that you see from people who view your art if you see those reactions and how do you feel about those reactions? That's a good question. Um, people seem to respond pretty deeply um, in that even if they don't know what they're looking at, they can relate to some part of that experience. I think there is this sort of iconic sense of it being all black work, black ink. There's a minimalism to it that some of the forms feel familiar, even if they don't mean anything at all. The way that a letter is just a construct, you know, the shape of the letter A, we all agreed upon what that is doesn't actually mean anything but we all have certain personalities or traits that we ascribe to like a capital I don't know maybe this is just something that I do but um like a capital M maybe because it starts the word masculine we're gonna feel that that's a strong kind of thing whereas a lowercase s is kind of more you know soft and flows a little bit more so there's a way that I think people respond to these shapes even with without even knowing the name of the painting they get some sort of feeling from the way that the form is portrayed and the show known notion um, that I hung at Old North is really about that um, this idea that what means anything uh, I forget exactly what the statement was. Come, what means anything? It comes from nothing. Yeah. Made of something. Something. Any. Everything. It was like. Yeah. It, it was anything. Nothing. Something. Everything. Right. And it's just this idea that nothing really means anything, but it's also how we've created everything. We've created our whole reality from essentially meaninglessness. And we've created connection with people through shared experience. Wow. I, I always, we've, we've loved your work from a distance since showing up the first time. The, one of the first places we went was Old North and we saw you on the wall. We saw you on, in like for sale. We're like, what is this? Who is this? Mm -hmm. What is, what is happening here? And so to your point, we had no idea the names of the pieces. We have no idea the state you were in when you made them. We didn't know who you were. But it, it spoke to us in some way. I appreciate that. Thank you. Of course. And I, hearing you speak about it, I just, I, I am, I always find myself like falling into awe with the truth that we are, humans are so different. Like I, I feel choked if I can't literally explain with the right words or with metaphor that can then be mirrored perfectly to match what I'm trying to communicate. And the thought 
that that is how you you know share or or unpack or whatever language you would use for it through your art i'm like oh my god i have no idea what it's like to speak in that language i can't even conceive of it there is definitely a a freedom in it that I mean, it's something that's really beautiful about art, that as an artist, you can have an intention of what you're trying to convey through your art, but people will always perceive it how they're going to perceive it. So there's a freedom in abstract art, especially, that you can put that intention into it, but it doesn't really matter to me how people perceive it. When, it is, when there is some shared experience, that is really powerful. But there's also this release in just accepting that we're all going to see the world a little differently. And that's actually really beautiful. And when we can share that with each other, that deepens each of our own experience to be able to say, well, I, oh, I saw it this way, but how did you see it? How is your experience different than mine? And be able to communicate about that and find a way to share that with each other. I love it. And just because this is a question that I've thought of since we started talking about the art and we didn't necessarily plan to go in so fast, so quick. Sure. Does it, does it start with you looking at a blank canvas and just like sticking it with mm -hmm. a paintbrush or how does it start? Like, cause it, there's so on some of your pieces, it seems like there are so few strokes, and I have no idea how you make the strokes look the way they do. Maybe it's one thing. Maybe it's hundreds of tiny ones. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But it seems like there's so few strokes that every single one is crazy important. And so what happens first? You just, like, s stab it, <laughs> then go? <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah. Um, it is really sort of like the um, practice of, painting an Enso, the circle, oh. the perfect circle in one stroke, where you are meditating on what you're going to do beforehand. And the meditation is more the act of the art than the act of actually putting brush to paper. Um, I try to not overthink the meditation part of it. I try to really center myself and you know hold the energetic feeling of whatever concept I'm ruminating on um let myself go into this space of you know like all right what have I been experiencing lately what are these sort of interactions with people that I'm holding on to and hold that without naming it and then let it out and that usually happens pretty quickly with several strokes of the brush on the paper. And usually there's a part where my my monkey mind will say like, oh, that would look better if you put a little bit over here. And sometimes I have to just say like, no, it's done. The painting's done. I'll tear it off, usually put it on the floor and start the next one. So I'll usually make... Um, at least five pieces. I also sort of have this thing where if I put ink on the palette, I can't stop painting until I've used all the ink up. It's a um, fun game. Yeah. So sometimes you'll just, you know, I'm just like, well, I have ink left. Let's see what comes out. And I'll usually make at least five paintings at a time. Um, if not 25, I go through a lot of paper. <laughs> And do all of them see the light of day in... No. Okay. Um, a lot of them do. Uh, there are a lot that are just kind of stacked back there that sometimes I'll revisit them later. I'll come back and say, actually, I think this one needs needs something here. And usually, like, there's a, there's a different feeling of me analytically saying, this isn't right, versus letting the painting sort of say, hey, I'm not done yet, um, and revisiting it from that perspective. Um, sometimes the analytical side of it gets in the way, 
And there are a lot of paintings that I just feel like, I don't know, they don't. Actually, now that I think about it, a lot of them do end up feeling complete at some point. But there are some that I'm just like, I don't, that's not really conveying anything. Or honestly, sometimes too, I'll just take the brush and black out the entire sheet of paper. Or just do something that's more about the movement of the painting than it is about the visual result or conveying something. It's more just like, I need to almost like punch a pillow sort of thing. Like, I just need to splash some some paint around. Um, I'm really excited about, um, I was telling you, hopefully getting a new space, uh, being able to work larger, because then I think there's an element of the movement of painting that you can start to paint with your whole body. Mm. I'm, I'm excited to explore that. That's so interesting. I never... I mean, I guess I have thought about the physical aspect of painting, but I think most people, or maybe it's just me, think of the mental aspect, right? Of like thinking of like, this is my next move of what I'm going to do in the emotional aspect of it. But the physical aspect is an interesting part of physically, like you said, moving your arm, moving your whole body. It's almost like a dance. Right. Absolutely. I had a studio mate that really explored that in a beautiful way, Carrie Burke. Um, even incorporating almost like performance art Mm -hmm. that they would have pieces that they would create in front of people so that part of the interaction was, was observing Mm -hmm. that movement and the result of the movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe let's take a step back and talk a little bit about like how, how you got into, how you got to where you are today. Okay. So, I know that's a quite a page. Well, it just, it's, it's, <laughs> meant, it's meant to be loose, but, you know, uh, mm-hmm. this could be, did you go to art school? Did you go to school? What I is, did. like, where where does this come from, your art? Um, I think that I, I come from a family of artists, in a way, a family of creative types. Um, I've always felt some sense of wanting to express something I don't know vaguely I also have really fought the idea of being an artist I never wanted to be a starving artist I never wanted to have to make my artwork make money um and I still feel like I'm not really a successful artist I don't pursue selling my paintings or selling my prints um, because I don't want to focus on the side of it that is tied to money. Uh, But I did go to school for design. um, And I feel like there's an interesting dichotomy between calling myself an artist and a designer, that the design side of my work allows me to be creative in a way that is more about solving problems. And it allows me to be creative in a way that I'm okay with tying to money. Design allows you to problem solve and you feel, Mm, you feel mm -hmm. more certain and, and fine with charging for that. But art, you, you seem to like letting it, be its own thing and not necessarily pursue the return, the explicit, this needs to put food on my table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I definitely feel that to really contribute to the art world, to make art that is pushing boundaries, you can't be making art for the sake of making money. You have to just make art for art's sake. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm. I feel really lucky to have a, a job that I like in the design world, that still allows me to be creative, that allows me to help people, um, and to make my living doing that. Yeah. 
so that art can just be an outlet. And I think the question was to how did I, how did I get here? Um, like I said, I never really wanted to be an artist. Uh, I would kind of dabble in different things. I've never really been patient enough to paint in a realistic style. Um, but I one day picked up my partner. Uh, he had a set of liquid acrylics, little dropper bottles, and I just picked out the black and one brush and a piece of paper and started painting kind of as this outlet just to see what came out. Um, and really liked the limitation of that. Only having one brush, only having one color, only having one size paper. There was no way to overthink it. There was no way to try to plan it out. It just happened. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And it, it felt really like a visual journal or something. It felt like I was able to let something out. And I didn't really care if other people liked it or not. Um, so I started posting it to Instagram under this handle, Weird Bad Art Machine, um, to also just sort of have fun with it, make it this silly thing that I could paint whatever I wanted. It can be bad art. It wasn't for the sake of even trying to contribute to the art world. It was so removed from what fine art that you see in galleries is at all. Um, but it felt good for me to make it, and that was enough. How long ago was it when you picked up that paintbrush and... Um, I would started. say, I think two years ago now. So really not that long in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Two, maybe three years. I'm really bad with time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, what stands out to me is that we, we have like had a post on how to kind of force creativity. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know if this was intentional or by accident, but it seems, my guess is intentional. Like creativity via constraint seems like a really good practice. I I have noticed that a lot of people, I mean, it's a common saying, it's uh, analysis paralysis. When you have, when there are so many options as to ways to start, things to do, uh, it blocks people. It's an excuse. It's a, it, it's a form of resistance in its own way. Absolutely. And, and I'm wondering if, did you, did you sort of s notice that you had all these constraints and that freed you up? Or did you create some of those constraints so that it would free you up? Or did it just kind of happen? I think it just kind of happened, but I definitely realized that that was part of the powerful aspect yeah. of it of like wow this is actually freeing that i don't have to think about what color to use or what brushes to use um it was it was unintentional i think though but there's a, it seems like there's a bunch of things that you've you've alluded to that follow that same kind of logic where um you know you you mentioned how you paint until the paint's gone yeah. that's a cool little constraint um there uh, you know, I, I go for five. Like, why why make one thing when you can go for five, 25, uh, what, whatever. Um, I think, you know, having the goal not be like create some masterpiece, but create enough art that I run out of paint is like a really uh, freeing thing. And the idea of this art is meant to be made by the bad art machine. <laughs> like, what a fun way to get reps and take the stress out of the outcome and just focus on the process of creating. I think that that by accident seems like some of the savviest, smartest, best advice you could have, you know, future you could have given to past you. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, I stumbled on something very, very fortunate in that way. Um, I'm not the kind of person that is into routine. 
that is into this idea of, you know, doing reps of something or saying, I'm going to have the discipline to go to the studio every day for two hours. Um, usually when I start to see the pattern and routine, I'm like, I got to shake this up. I got to do something different. So it worked out really well that that had this sort of natural repetition to it. Um, I'm also very lucky that I stumbled on something that isn't terribly expensive. Um, I think that I struggled with other art forms because the material cost was this own sort of pressure that materials are precious and the materials I use are still precious, but I use kind of cheap paper. I don't use arches, archival, anything. Um, the ink I use, though I use a lot of it, it's liquid and it, I don't know. I, I use a lot of it only because I make a lot of art. Um, so when I ventured into even acrylic and canvas, the canvas becomes very precious because the cost of it, if you make bad art, then it's almost a disservice to the canvas that you're not making something that other people will want to hang on their walls. Um, so I appreciate that I stumbled on something that could be more playful um, and that could exist outside of that sort of fine art world sense of having to put a value on every single piece. It does make it challenging that my, I don't know, I actually really enjoy this. Uh, my originals usually look crappier uh, than the prints, and I don't sell any originals really. Um, the prints I can Photoshop a little bit. If there's a random little speck on the side or something gets smudgy, I can clean them up a tiny bit. Um, and they end up, the color contrast, the paper, they look really crisp and beautiful. And sometimes the originals start to get a little messy. Um, usually in the fine art world, the originals should sell for hundreds of dollars. Um, but in the way that I've experienced it, there's actually a lot more value in the prints. Huh. And I enjoy that that means that more people can experience that piece of art. Technology. <laughs> Technology. Yeah. Yep. So, and I, and I know that a lot of what we have been talking about is the, in particular, the style of art that you sell at Old North, which is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this word. Glycical. Gly Glisse? I don't know either. <laughs> Anyone out there knows how to pronounce that word. But it's G-I-C-L-E-E. -E. Yes. And I, if I'm correct, it's actually just a fancy way to say high quality inkjet Got printing. Mm -hmm. um, huh. But it is the standard for fine art printing. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, so yeah, that... Sa Sarah used it a couple times. I'm like, are you making this word up? Glisse? <laughs> Glisse? Yeah. I don't know. Glycy. Glycy? <laughs> I have no... <laughs> <laughs> but we were, we were, I think, talking a lot about that black and white um, prints that you make, but mm -hmm. you also make other art, which is has color in it. And I've been starting shapes. to explore it a little bit. Um, it, I would still kind of put it under the weird bad art side of things. And I've also started doing digital art. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I've been trying to just explore whatever seems interesting. Uh, but those those forms immediately lose that aspect of the constraints being what allows you to have that freedom to express something. Um, something about color, there are so many more connotations, associations that we make with color that if you make a black oblong shape, that could be a multitude of things. As soon as you make that shape green, it starts to become a leaf or, you know, some something that our brains try to associate. Yeah. And I have kind of struggled with trying to move into color for that reason. Um, and then also what I said that 
working on canvas, there's a sense that the materials are more precious. Um, so I've enjoyed actually working uh, with digital art more recently because although the iPad was very expensive, now that I have it, I can make as many pieces as I want without cost and have that sort of freedom to just explore with things. Um, but Is it harder to say this piece is done when it's digital? Because there's no ink that runs out and there's no, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. that would be, to me, I, I could imagine, like, it's in infinite the amount of times you could tweak the thing. Absolutely. And you can even separate things by layer and say, wait, I think this green needs to be a little more blue or mess with the levels and the brightness of something. And it is, it's a lot harder to say that a piece is done wow. when it's digital. I'm wondering, is there anyone that's informed your view of art? I, as you speak about not wanting your art, not wanting to put the burden on your art of being, uh, you know, like income, that screams Elizabeth Gilbert to me. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is there any, is this just how you show up and how you think of the world? Is it because you come from an artist family and you've seen hard you know, starving artists experience, like what, what informs your view of art as a meditation and art as like the thing that you need to channel out of you, but also, uh, you know, the actual painting, I don't know, who, who's yeah. a part of that? I feel a lot of conflict about being an artist, still trying to make money with it. I feel a lot of conflict about just existing in this capitalistic society. Yeah. So I think I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, you asked what uh, what people have influenced me. Actually, there is someone, too, that uh, published a zine recently, Nicole Lavelle. The zine is called The Relation Between Things in a Continuum. And she really really eloquently explains a lot of the tension that I feel about being both an artist and a designer, about using your creativity as a way to make a living. And she works in San Francisco and works for big tech, kind of talks about it in the sense of feeding the beast she's working for the beast um and feeling the conflict of that but using it in a way that by being a designer using her talents and having technology corporations and sort of this capitalist structure be her patrons that enables her to work for nonprofits, work for her friends for very affordable rates. And that's something that really resonated with me and um, somewhat easing that tension, I feel, of having to charge people to make websites or sometimes even just the tension I feel of working within a system where you have to ask people for money for things that they may or may not need and put values on things that may or may not feel right. Um, and she resolves what she says in the zine in an, a way that actually doesn't really resolve itself, but just says, like, these are the questions that I'm asking, mm. and this is sort of where I'm at with it. But this is a hope that it evolves. And, yeah, it's all very kind of large concepts that I think people are waking up to. The fact that a lot of people aren't happy with the way that they exist within our society and the way that our society functions. And hopefully we can restructure that so that we're all 
serving our values and serving each other more effectively. Yeah. We, for, uh, in fear of a plug, we had a episode come out where we talked about money things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking or hearing is that there's a, what she's pointing to is something like what we said around the idea of she works for tech so that she can show appreciation in some form or another to businesses. And, and we try to change the money thing because money can be icky and just the language we use is appreciation. Yeah. And, And people often are, looking for ways to show you appreciation money happens to be one of the ways uh it's to your point society's way typically and the question i think that might be bigger is like is this valuable is it not uh do they need it and with specifically in art need is a funny thing yeah but allowing people the opportunity to show appreciation growing like making money so that we can appreciate other people's work, right? Like I want to be able to buy the zine of whoever you mentioned, Nicole. Um, And one of the ways that I'm able to is if I've grown my own worth to other people or allow provide people with opportunities to show me their appreciation. Right. It's a, it's a funny, weird thing, yeah. this whole uh I think of it more like like capital. a directional I don't know, like a flow, yes. right? It's like it's people energy. will show me appreciation, not necessarily through money, it could be time, it could mm-hmm. be words, could be um with some act of service. Um and by receiving that and having like my own cup be full, I'm able to show appreciation to other people. Absolutely. If that makes sense. I think that is a really positive way to look at it. To me, where it gets lost is that so many people don't have enough. Their needs aren't being met. They're acting out of places of desperation. And even it gets so confusing in being bombarded with different ideas of what is and isn't valuable on the Internet, on social media, all the time. That even as an artist, it's very easy to start to try to make things that other people will just perceive as valuable and not that you actually appreciate or that you feel like contribute to a conversation. And I think that when you are operating from a place of enough you're more able to trust that people will appreciate the same things that you appreciate, that you don't have to manipulate the system to try to attract something that really may or may not have any value. Um, So I think that the more we all kind of trust that flow, then we'll actually create things of true value Mm -hmm. that other people truly appreciate. Yeah heard and, and praise hands yeah <laughs> it, the, the the language that you hit exactly on the head is like operating from enough yeah and that's why i'm all in on like gratitude journals because it's even if you objectively don't have a lot if you can start to believe that where you are is is enough for right now like and it, and there is like there is an opportunity and there is reason to be thankful today then maybe it can grow and it's so hard to say that to some people and i know it um yeah, I mean, but that's what I, it's a beautiful thing it's the dream to absolutely. to live from a place of enough um and also then be detached from the outcomes those two things if you can <laughs> figure those two out people i mean a lot of that has to do with what I think of as practicing non-dualism, um, practicing this idea that what you are ingrained to or what you grow up as thinking is 
good or bad, enough, not enough, you really define that however you want to. And you can create your own perception of your reality around that. That if you decide it's enough, then that's all that matters. It's very hard to kind of detach, again, from what other people perceive about that. But if you can stand truly in that, then you can operate from a place of enough, even if you're living out of your car. A lot of people, I mean, I think that's part of why the van life movement is really popular, is that people have realized, like, wow, I can define what I need however I want. And that's really powerful. Agreed. Damn, that's so good. That's kind of what I was thinking when you're talking about enough. It's like, well, what is enough? Yeah. There's something different for everybody. And there's, I mean, there's something different, I think, too, about someone who is literally starving. That's, that's the. Literally doesn't have their basic needs met. Like, that is not enough. I mean, you'd have to be very mentally. Strong. Gandhi-ish. I was <laughs> going to say, ascetic monks, they, they do achieve that. But I think mm-hmm. that that's something that societally we need to examine, is what are we all trying to create in saying that this is enough for someone? Mm-hmm. Um, something my mom would say is that she lives simply so that others may simply live. I've always really liked that. So that by changing my definition of what is enough, hopefully that means that I'm freeing up some resource for someone else to have it. Or even what we were saying of by me working this job and making money um, to try to gain something from the value I give other people, if I can then turn around and give that to someone who doesn't have as much, then we all can uplift each other in that way. You're here. Yeah. Dang. <laughs> this is what artists think about. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is what art is really about. It's not about color or, I don't know, at, <sighs> least, at least to me. Yeah. Someone I came across that I really resonated with their thoughts on how they create art. Um, I hope I'm going to say her name right. I believe it's Talba Auerbach. And she's actually in the Salad for President book, I think is how I found out about her. Really great book if you haven't come across it. It's we'll, a, we'll have the official links to all of this in, <laughs> in the show notes. Uh, it's a, a book with interviews from different artists, and they each create a salad. So it's a very interesting style recipe book. But she speaks about how her work, she created abstract art, went through the gallery scene, her paintings became highly valued. She had collectors. I believe some of her paintings even sold for millions of dollars. She was very put off by the experience of going through that process. And when she stopped painting would receive threats even from her collectors saying that she needed to keep painting or she needed to keep up the value of the work that she was doing. And she decided to respond to that by shifting her focus to making art that was very accessible. Um, Art that maybe would be more on the side of design, art on physical goods, like pins, I believe, Um, tote bags, that type of thing, but art that was not additioned, not limited, and was priced in a way that people could afford it, Um, which I love, was kind of a big fuck you to the high-end art world, to their collectors, just to say that you don't own me, you don't own this, you don't own this exclusivity for people to be able to experience art. Um, So that really resonated with me. And I think I've always struggled with the idea of commoditizing anything, really. Um, The way that capitalism has overtaken our society is really problematic. And I struggle with how to fit into that in a way that 
feels good and aligns with my values. I understand that people have to make money to survive, um, at least in the way that we've structured the world we live in now. Um, But to be able to do that in a way that isn't limiting people's access to something that should be universal, like art. Um, That's something I try to balance. Thank you. I love that. That's a great answer. Uh, We will... We will look her up and and link to salad for president. Yeah. Um, beautiful. And so I'm wondering. I'm wondering, knowing that this practice it, to me seems meditative for you and sure. like something that just needs to come out. Um, how how could or would you potentially have changed the last two years. Is there anything that you might have thought to do different now that you've been through some of it? Hmm. Because it's outside in. It seems like you're in a pretty cool place where you can create what seems like as much art as you almost want to. And you have this job that supports it and allows, provides the space and flexibility to create it. Um, Are you in air quotes a you know the, a great place and you're just thankful is there anything that you would tweak in a ideal world I am very thankful uh that I am able to support myself doing something that I love that also supports me making art that I love to make um I don't actually paint that often <laughs> so I don't think that I would say I wish I painted more often um, or that I want to, you know, kind of create that discipline around it of you have to be in the studio several hours a week or something like that. But one of my goals um, and something I've been able to do kind of this past summer was to take my materials outside um, and be informed by an environment and respond to it somewhat, not necessarily try to represent it, but uh, maybe represent it in a more expressionistic or energetic way. Um, I really enjoy that my setup is very simple, so it's easy to travel with it. So I would say that's something that, you know, in an ideal world or maybe looking forward, I would like to do more of. I'd love to, I know we talked a lot about your painting and your, and, 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 but we've also kind of known that you have a part-time job as well as a designer. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about that. Cause that seems to be the backbone that's allowed you to sure do a lot of the art that you do. Absolutely. Um, I work for a company called Integrative. That's a web design and marketing company. And I do design work, web design, a little bit of web development, kind of front end. I'm working there part time right now. And just having that steady income is really valuable. It's a team that I enjoy working with. We work with a lot of really wonderful clients. And I feel like we are actually able to do work that positively impacts people's journey. Um, I really enjoy making websites because it's an opportunity to explore how someone wants to present what they do to the world, how they want to connect with people, how they want to explain what they're all about. Um, So I have been working there maybe four or five years now. And we just have a really great team that I I enjoy being a part of. Do you think that you would still work that kind of job even if you had the money, like the income, to support your other work? That is a good question. I don't know. 
I think I probably would still want to do some sort of design work. One of my favorite things about design is that whereas art is somewhat self-serving and that it's expressing my own experience, design has more to do with solving problems for people and taking some idea that they have, some vision that they have for how they want to tell their story, and I get to be the medium to make that happen, whether they don't have the skills or the time to fully create that. Um, I try to be a good listener and understand this sort of vision that they have and transcribe that for them. And working with people in which at the end of the project, they say something like, this is exactly what I had in mind. That to me is really powerful to be able to to help someone make their vision come to life. So even if I did have a enough money to be a full-time artist, I think I would still want to do some sort of design work. Yeah. I feel like, and then maybe this is just me thinking about what I would do, but I feel like having that interaction with people would be really important when you are working on art that is often done alone. Yes. Right? Like having that balance between going in and maybe using another part of your brain that you don't use when you're painting. Absolutely. Helps kind of keep both of them going along. Absolutely. There's a, a social dynamic too that I thrive in those interactions with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's also sort of the left brain, right brain, being able to use that more analytical side, uh, I think is really important to me and allows me to focus more on um, solving problems in a unique way or even integrating those two sides of myself where something isn't purely just creative or aesthetic, um, that it has to fit into certain constraints or align with somebody else's idea of what what would be successful. So I definitely think that, yeah, using using both sides of, of that is really important. I love it. And I want to continue down something that you sort of opened up is like the future. Mm-hmm. What do you see in the future? You mentioned that a studio is a target in 2020. This will come out in 2020. What do you what do you see when you when you think ahead? Um I am very excited. It I don't want to jinx it, but I do think that it seems uh, pretty much set that I'm going to be sharing a studio with uh, my friend Sarah Mulvey of Revelry, Revelry Tintype um, in the River Arts District, so I'm very excited about that. Looking ahead, I would like to collaborate more. Sarah and I have even talked about some ways that we would like to collaborate. Um, I kind of mentioned working on larger pieces. I'm very interested in that that idea. And I don't know. I think that just keeping on, even as things grow or evolve, trying to stay true to that idea of letting this be something that comes from a really true place, a place of exploration and not a place of trying to create something that's other people see as successful or makes a lot of money. I would hope to stay true to that. A word that's been coming up in my world a lot and I I've heard it I've heard its cousins said in the in our conversation so far is the idea of detachment. Hmm. Right? So like um kind of uh, for whatever reason I'm I'm into the Bhagavad Gita right now, which is like this, uh, one of the famous quotes and we use it in our own 
in our own ways here in the U.S. is like uh, the right to labor. Mm-hmm. And in an ideal world, you would be detached from the fruits of that labor. Like it's the process. It's the practice. It's it's the doing that counts. Um, and if you can be fully present in the doing, typically, hopefully, um, there's its own sense of fulfillment. And if you can figure out how to be detached from outcomes, it's a pretty nice place to be. Absolutely. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty nice place to be. Yeah. Creating for the sake of creating, not for the sake of how it will be perceived or what it can bring you and as the output. Yeah. It's uh, certainly a goal. And that's, I mean, that, that can be in all things. It can be in relationships like, yeah. you know, uh, making friends for an outcome versus to be a friend. Right. It's uh, it's something I'm, I've been meditating a lot on. I'm trying to live more detached. I always play chess matches in my head, and I'm like, steps it. Like, what if this happens? And what happens? And how do you respond? And mm-hmm. I try and find my body again. I try to. That one of the beautiful ways I've heard it said is like, have your head where your butt is. <laughs> <laughs> like, keep your head here, like where where I am. Uh, it's hard for me, but I I love that as your goal in the practice. I have a feeling it's going to work out. That's my guess. I hope so. (laughs) We haven't talked a lot about Asheville. I'd love to know why are you here in Asheville? Um, Well, I grew up near here Mm -hmm. in Hendersonville. And I went to school in Raleigh, moved to Colorado after school. And... um, at some point just felt like it was time to come back. I moved to Colorado with a guy. We broke up. It's just like, I need to go home. It's time to go back. And sometimes I worry that I'm getting stuck here, (laughs) but I also feel very strongly that this is a really powerful place. I think it's one of the most beautiful places in the world to live. And I think a lot of other people are starting to figure that out. But I feel that there's some part of this community that I want to contribute to. And as you see a place that you love shift and grow, how would I be serving it to leave? I would rather stay here and contribute to the way that it's growing. And... That's what I hope to do. I I really want to share all of the beautiful things about this place with other people and hopefully show them how to respect and care for it the way that that I hope to. And I'd like to take an opportunity to thank you <laughs> for doing that with us. We are admittedly bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and naive, And uh, already you have been a great asset to us as we try to honor this place and specifically the artist community here where we know very little truly about. Um, If you were to, and I I know you can't shout out all of your friends (laughs) and the whole connection, but if you were to kind of give like a 101 to someone who doesn't know Asheville or maybe is new in Asheville, like what things should we think about it? Is it just River Arts? Like what other ideas? In terms ideas? of the art scene or sure. just in general? Yeah, or, or Well, in I'm going to take an opportunity to not talk about the art scene, but talk about being in nature. I think one of the things that frustrates me about people that come here is that they don't respect our natural areas. And just learning a little bit about Leave No Trace, um, learning a little bit of trail etiquette, And I don't know, take the time to find somewhere that's not the top three results on Google. Or maybe don't, because then those places will be overrun too. What's an example of of trail etiquette for a couple of uh, New York streetwalkers who uh, I can't (laughs) imagine we're doing the right things on trails, but what what would be trail etiquette 101? Um, I think just kind of understanding that 
don't be on your phone. <laughs> you can pull out your phone and take a couple pictures, but you don't need to be Instagram storying every part of the trail. Um, don't be playing music on your phone at the top of an overlook. There, There's something to be said that um, you should be in nature to observe your surroundings and just be aware of the other people that are there and the experience that they're trying to have um, and pick up your trash. Yeah. <laughs> We have, we've been doing pretty good. Yeah, so far. Most people do a really good job. It's it's something I think that people don't realize that, you know, one small thing, enough people doing that one small thing of leaving some toilet paper right on the side of the trail or some trash or their dog's shit or something, enough people do that and it starts to really impact the the ecology of that place. Um, so just having some awareness around that, that this place isn't yours and you really are the visitor in it and should respect it for all of the wildlife, all of the plants that live there. Another thing that I think is a double-edged sword is that a lot of people are becoming more aware of the ideas around foraging and I think it's great that people are learning to identify plants and learn about their uses, but they don't always respect the ways in which a certain place's ecology may or may not be conducive to harvesting those plants. They might take too much. They might, even just taking some part of a plant stand when that stand isn't thriving or it's not the right time of year to harvest um, might mean that that species can no longer live in that environment. So even small ways that people have an impact on the ecology of a place, just having an awareness around that is very important to me. I love where you went with that question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what about with the Asheville community and the people that live here? What what comes to mind when you think about where Asheville is today, maybe where it once was, because um, you have experienced what it was maybe years ago. Sure. And where you think it's going. Or could go. Or could go. No. Um, I think that there is a really beautiful way that our community has responded to growth in that the small businesses have chosen to collaborate with each other to uplift each other when they could be competing but they've sort of recognized that we're all in this together and I think that the people who live here are very aware of the choice that they make when they spend their dollar and how going to a bar that is funded by some developer is going to put a dollar in the pocket of someone whose interests may not even be considering the people that live in Asheville. Um, but for the most part, the people who actually do live here and, and are involved in our community are aware of that and do an incredible job of promoting each other's events and buying things that their friends and community members make as gifts. And I really appreciate that. I think one thing that even in the past few years maybe has shifted is that downtown is not really for locals anymore. You have to calculate the time and the way that you go downtown. And I still try to make an effort to do that because there are some really amazing local businesses downtown that I want to support. Um, but it is frustrating when 
some of the restaurants that have been there even for decades, you can't get a table anymore. Um, I don't know what the solution to that is. I wish that I did. Um, but I think that being mindful of trying to really support the parts of the community that you want to see stick around uh, is something I would encourage people to do. I love that. We have a question that we'd like to ask about magic wands. Mm, okay. So imagine Sarah and I have a magic wand or someone in our listening audience has a magic wand and you have one wish and it'll come true. What might you ask? <laughs> I wish that bike lanes and public transportation infrastructure could magically be implemented all over the city. Greenways, I have this weird vision of the Patton Bridge turning into this amazing pedestrian walkway with bike lanes. Um... I really love to ride my bike. Asheville is a horrible place to ride bikes. There are very few bike lanes. People don't watch out for for cyclists. Um, and then also the bus system, I think, kind of needs a lot of love injected into it. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be my wish. It's a wonderful answer. We here, here. Thank you, listener, yeah. who has the magic wand <laughs> to implement that. City council members, yeah. <laughs> take note. Um, yeah. I love that. What do you do outside of working and painting? Um, what kind of things, fun things, do you like to do? Um, I like to go hiking. Mm -hmm. I like to futz around in my little rental house container garden. Mm -hmm. And... Which, uh, <laughs> in my eyes, is this entire rental house because the <laughs> there are so much green. Every place you look, there is something living, uh, to me, thriving. But I, I guess some of them are working harder than others. Yeah, some of them miss the summertime. Mm. But yes, I, I like caring for plants. Um, yeah, I like exploring new places. And yeah. Do you have any favorite, or actually, better question is, when you have friends in town, where do you take them around Asheville? Could be mm. restaurants, could be hikes, shops. Shop. Usually, we'll do a little downtown tour, Lexington, Old North, and some of the shops there. Mostly just because I think people want to get a feel for what downtown is like. Mm -hmm. um, but I usually do try to take people somewhere outside. If it's the summertime, we go jump in a waterfall somewhere. Uh, that was one of my favorite things to do growing up. Pretty much every weekend, we would be at DuPont or somewhere in Pisgah, just hanging out by the river. So to me, that is a quintessential Asheville experience. I love that. Yeah. We, uh, we have not been in a waterfall yeah, we're trying to right-size that in 2020. <laughs> Add it to the list, yeah. for sure. Yeah. You can do it in the winter, too. It's like a cold plunge. Yeah, like a, but... a Wim Hof. Type <laughs> <of thing. laughs> sauna house, watch out. Sauna yeah. house. Natural. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go to the sauna house after, oh. for sure. <laughs> Love that. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you wanted to make sure that you said because clearly mm -hmm. everyone stays up sleepless nights before this, <laughs> before this happens. Was there anything <laughs> that you were hoping to touch on that we might not have uh, gotten to? Um, maybe, but I don't know how to... I just like to follow where the conversation goes. Cool. I may have been talking to myself in the car as I was driving home from my friends this morning. <laughs> and it sounded very different than this conversation, but that's okay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like the paintbrush. You just yeah. do it and let it go. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, we we like the art that was expressed in this conversation. So thank mm -hmm. you for the time. Thanks for having me. What we'll say is the last question is how might our listeners find you on the internet? I am on the internet, yes. Um, I have a website, garnetfisher.com, and I post to Instagram 
sometimes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, those are probably the best two places. Cool. And we'll have links to all of that. But thank you so much for the time. Uh, thank you for having us in your home. And of it's course. been a privilege. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And that was episode 38 with Nettie Fisher. And is, I mean, I just, the intentionality with which she speaks and the thoughtfulness, it really hit me. I mean, we, we talk about feeling really zened out. I think it shows up in the episode, but really zened out uh, in her space with all the plants. And um, I don't know, I just absolutely am so grateful that we got to spend time with her and hear more of her story. Yeah, she has a very calm aura about her. Um, and and like I said, seems very tuned in to a higher level of thinking, perhaps, um, and, and a more of a spiritual level as well. So we hope you enjoyed that episode. If there's something that you want to learn more about, something that we mentioned, like a book or a link in the episode, you can visit the show notes page at makingitinashville.com forward slash 038. And we just want to take a moment to remind you about an upcoming Making It in Asheville event. This one is our first in a series of Monday Maker Mixer events. We're going to be running them on the last Monday of every month this year, 2020. The first one is January 27th. We'll be hosting a mixer at night um, to connect our community members, to try and connect past guests with listeners and listeners with future guests and um, it's just an opportunity for all of us to get together and get to know one another um, and where possible create value for one another so uh, the first one you can find on our website making it in ashville.com forward slash events please do rsvp so we can help uh, kind of make the venue aware of how many people we think might show up and we do have limited space as well. So um, by RSVPing, you're guaranteed that you'll have space to come into the event. Like I said, we have um, a venue and it's a limited amount of people can come. So please RSVP to make sure you have a spot. And we're also going to be hosting a beginner's podcasting workshop towards the end of February. Uh, this is great workshop if you have thought about starting a podcast and you're not quite sure about the details of how to go about doing it. The event and the space is limited to 10 participants or less. And so this is going to be very hands-on. This is going to be from step one to step 10. This is going to be a fast track for someone who is thinking about or has been thinking about starting a podcast for a while. We're going to go from idea to execution, talk through all of the things like naming and scheduling and posting and publishing and the equipment you need and the ways to edit and improve audio and also how to market and support the podcast. Yeah. So again, this is a really great way to jumpstart to launching your own podcast. We ourselves uh, learned how to podcast just by doing, it took us a long time. We had to do a lot of research. Uh, we learned, we made a lot of mistakes along the way. So we really want to help you um, figure this out in a fast way and give you all the information and tools that you need right up front to get started. So the workshop will be held on Saturday, February 29th from 2 to 5 p.m. It'll be at Focal Point Coworking. You can register online by visiting makingitinashville.com forward slash events. Again, we have a very limited space to 10 people. Uh, so please register in advance. Make sure you get your spot. If you like this episode, please let us know by liking and reviewing on Apple Podcasts. That is the de facto place to do it. It helps all of these episodes get discovered by future podcast listeners uh, it means the world to us and to our guests. So uh, thank you in advance for taking a moment to either throw five stars up or write a quick review. There should be links available in all of the podcast players. So thanks again. And if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the podcast, you can nominate them at makingitinashville.com forward slash podcast. Uh, you can also let us know via Instagram or Facebook. We're always looking for new guests and upcoming seasons. And finally, just a reminder that this episode is brought to you by Making It Creative. Making It Creative is our own marketing agency based here in Asheville. We work with small, passionate business owners here in town and around 
the country uh, to help them clarify their message, communicate with their customers better, uh, create better storytelling, and more. Visit makingitcreative.com to learn more. That was episode 38. Woohoo! Unbelievable. Time flies. High five, boo. That skill of holding space for people, I think, is also something I really admire. And uh, my roommate in college really challenged me to be a better listener. I think there's some anxious tendency that I have, and I think a lot of people have, to kind of like be affirmative, be engaged. And that sometimes leads you to talk over people or all these weird nervous tics and things that it's really uh, the skill of being a good conversationalist is universally applicable. And the best thing we've learned so far is tell me more about that. Yeah. You want to be you so make, simple. You want to make someone think that you're good at talking? Just say, tell me more about that. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about that. When so simple. Ugh. I want to paint. Ha, 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 ha.